So let's talk about dating and avoidant attachment. Seven must know triggers. Have you ever felt like you're chasing emotional intimacy in your relationship, but you just keep hitting a wall? Well, maybe you've experienced your partner pulling away when you express deep emotions. Maybe there's avoidance or dismissive behavior when you wanna talk about future plans. Or maybe you experience a kind of shutdown or retreat from your partner during conflicts that seem really important to address. As a result, you might find yourself wondering why it feels like your partner is holding back even when things seem to be going so well and really wanting to know how to create emotional closeness without pushing them away. While loving someone with avoidant attachment can sometimes be challenging, but showing up as a more secure partner that creates a safe space for both of you to grow together can be rewarding and you are not alone in this. In my online community, especially my Facebook group that has over 25,000 members, individuals frequently share posts and comments that echo these challenges in their relationships. For example, recently a member posted the question, can someone with avoidant attachment style have a successful relationship? Well, in today's video segment, we are going to define avoidant attachment and the common signs that your partner might be avoidant. We're gonna look at the impact this may have on your relationship and seven triggers that you should be aware of and how to mitigate them. So make sure you grab your pen and paper because you are not gonna wanna miss this one. And if you are new to my channel, welcome. My name is Brianna McWilliam and I am a licensed and board certified creative arts therapist with more than 15 years in the field, helping adults struggling with insecure attachment go from self-doubting to self-sovereign so they can attract the soul-shaking passionate partnerships that they want. And I do this using a psycho-spiritual approach to creative arts interventions which I call the McWilliam Method. The content on my YouTube channel is derived from my online courses, which you can learn more about through the link in the caption of this video. If you like what you see in here and you want to learn more, make sure you like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications. I put up videos once a week and I wouldn't want you to miss out. So let's just dive right in. What is avoidant attachment style? Well, avoidant attachment is a blueprint for how you like to give and receive love. It is defined by a frequency of thought, feelings, and behaviors geared towards maintaining a certain amount of emotional distance in order to preserve a sense of autonomy and personal independence. At its core, it's a pattern of coping born out of a fundamental fear of emotional dependency or being manipulated and placing a high value on self-reliance. Psychologically speaking, people with avoidant attachment style often equate closeness with a loss of autonomy, and so they steer clear of situations that could trigger these deeply ingrained fears. So let's talk about some signs of avoidant attachment. Now, typical signs of avoidant attachment might include things like creating emotional distance, hesitancy in committing to making any kind of fear plans, or keeping conversations at somewhat of a surface level. It's not that they're unemotional or that they don't care. They're just careful about letting anyone too close into their emotional core. Other signs might include dodging conflict or minimizing emotional conversations as both situations would disrupt their carefully balanced sense of self. And this is typically held together by rigid but fragile boundaries. They are usually particularly sensitive and can take on other people's emotional energy without even realizing it, which is why they ask for space from emotionally intense people and situations. If you'd like to learn more about avoidant attachment, including the strengths of avoidant partners, I invite you to check out the video on my YouTube channel, Avoidant Partners and Their Four Strengths. Now, how does avoidant attachment affect relationships? Well, the impact of avoidant attachment on relationships can be profound, often leading to a cycle known as the anxious avoidant trap, where the push-pull dynamics between partners can create a turbulent emotional landscape. Now, in the anxious avoidant trap, both partners often struggle to understand and accommodate each other's attachment needs, and that leads to a cycle of conflict and distress. And without any intervention, the relationship can suffer from things like chronic dissatisfaction, emotional exhaustion, and ultimately it can lead to the dissolution of the relationship. For example, I would like you to imagine Sarah, who has an anxious attachment style, and her partner Alex, who is more of an avoidant partner. Now Sarah craves closeness and reassurance, which Alex tends to find smothering. The more Sarah pushes for that intimacy, the more Alex withdraws, fearing the loss of his own independence. And so this triggers Sarah's anxiety, leading to a heightened demand for connection, which in turn amplifies Alex's avoidance, and it becomes the classic anxious avoidant trap. Now, here are a few signs of the anxious avoidant trap. There might be roller coaster dynamics in the relationship, a lot of highs and lows, with Sarah feeling really loved during moments of connection, only to feel deserted and abandoned when Alex gets overwhelmed and pulls away. Then we have pursuit and distancing tendencies. 
So Sarah's pursuit of closeness is often met with Alex's distancing behavior, creating that cycle of chase and retreat. There's also a lot of inconsistent communication, periods where the communication flows, but then it's disrupted by Alex's tendency to kind of go silent and leave Sarah anxious and uncertain of where the relationship stands. Then there are intermittent patterns of intimacy. So the couple experiences intense moments of intimacy followed by cold withdrawals, and that confuses and hurts Sarah while at the same time leaving Alex feeling like he can't succeed in relationships. And then we can have some reactivation of early wounds and insecurities. So Sarah's sense of neediness is intensified by Alex's aloofness. And so while Alex's avoidance is deepened by Sarah's clinginess, there can also be reactivation of early attachment wounds and insecurities. So Sarah's neediness is intensified by Alex's distancing and aloofness, and his avoidance is deepened by Sarah's clinginess and trying harder. There can also be a habit of sabotage in the relationship. So it is repeatedly sabotaged by patterns of conflict and reconciliation with each partner's attachment system sort of continuously being on high alert. Now, if you wanna learn more about the anxious avoidant trap and how this plays out, check out one of my most popular videos, Anxious Avoidant Relationships, How to Escape the Trap. Okay, so let's dive into the meat of our video here today, and that is seven triggers for avoidant attachment style and how to mitigate them. So first, let's take a look at emotional intensity as a trigger for avoidant partners. Now, are you hearing, I love you, but you're just not feeling a love? Well, saying I love you can be a minefield when you're an avoidant partner. They might struggle to believe you for several reasons. So they might think that you're in love with the idea of being in love, and so those words feel kind of cliche to them. It could also be that they feel it's too soon for such a deep expression, which then pressures them to feel like they have to reciprocate before they're ready. Or they might feel overly responsible for your emotional well-being, and that's a level of influence that they don't want as it encroaches on their sense of freedom. So how do we mitigate emotional intensity? Well, the first thing to do is to help them understand that emotional vulnerability is not synonymous with losing control. Opening up emotionally isn't laying down a mandate. It's just an invitation. Make it clear that when you express your feelings, you're not accusing them of failing you or of not being on the same page. Instead, you're providing a bridge to connect on a more intimate level. Additionally, you might try emphasizing that by sharing your feelings, you're assuming responsibility for them. It's not a burden that you're trying to give them to resolve. So you can even say something like, when I tell you how I feel, it's not to make you responsible for it. I'm sharing a part of myself so that I can grow closer to you. Number two, future talking. Have you ever been promised a whirlwind weekend getaway that mysteriously just never appeared? Well, avoidant partners can be masters of future talking. They'll paint out an idyllic picture of a romantic getaway, or it could be a spur of the moment kind of adventure. And yet when you try to turn that talk into something real and planned in reality, suddenly they can become elusive. And so the excitement turns into anxiety. They may even go radio silent for a few days. And it's not that they don't mean it when they say it, it's just that the commitment to the action is more suffocating than playing with the fantasy. So how do we mitigate future talking in relationships? Well, we might try framing these conversations as explorations rather than commitments. So instead of asking them to confirm plans, you can just share your intentions clearly. So for example, you know, I really like the idea that we could do a weekend trip. I'm thinking I'm gonna book it myself. Would you be interested in joining? So this approach leaves the door open for them to participate without feeling obligated. They retain their sense of freedom and they can opt in or out as they please. Number three, conflict can be triggering for our avoidant partners. So do fights with your partner leave you feeling like you have to navigate an emotional minefield? Well, conflict can trigger a complicated array of emotions with an avoidant partner, often stemming from how conflict was dealt with in their own childhood and upbringing. So it could have been volatile, maybe it was swept under the rug, or it could have been a situation filled with emotional manipulation and passive aggression. In any case, conflict was a signal of danger for them. So they missed out on learning that conflict can actually be a way to deepen understanding and intimacy in a relationship. So in essence, people usually fight because they're feeling disconnected and they're struggling to regain that sense of unity. So how can we mitigate the effects of conflict in a relationship with an avoidant partner? Well, here's how we might make it a little less intimidating. So first, you wanna stay present. You wanna avoid dredging up past grievances or casting any kind of blame. Instead, try to engage with an open-ended question aimed at their current state of mind. Well, how do you do that? Well, that's the second part. You're gonna observe without analyzing. 
So you're going to notice your partner's body language without overtly scrutinizing it so that you can look to it for valuable clues. Once you've observed their body language, try to speak their language. So an avoidant individual often feels safer discussing their thoughts rather than their feelings. So for example, you might replace a loaded statement like, you seem upset, probably due to your childhood baggage. It's gonna help if you talk about it. Instead of that, try a more inviting and immediate question. So I noticed that you just crossed your arms and looked away. What's on your mind? Maybe I can help. Now by focusing on the here and now, you allow your avoidant partner to engage without feeling overwhelmed or intruded upon. You're also making it about the connection here in the present moment, not about solving a problem or fixing something for them. Number four, commitment. So do you find that every time you talk about taking the next step, your partner puts on invisible running shoes? Well, here's why. Commitment can be a joyful milestone, but for an avoidant partner, it can feel like an encroachment on their freedom and their independence. So the idea of planning a future together doesn't just signify a deepening of emotional ties, but it can also instigate fears of failure or of losing oneself. So their apprehension is usually rooted in the concern that commitment equals a loss of freedom or worse, that it sets them up for future failure and disappointment. So being commitment averse doesn't mean that they don't care about you. Sometimes it can be the very opposite. They may very well visualize a future with you, but they feel paralyzed by, by all the what ifs. What if they can't meet your expectations? What if they disappoint you or themselves? So they can be terrified by committing. Um, they'll either lose you or the connection that you have now because they won't be able to deliver on some kind of promise or they'll lose themselves in that process. So how do we mitigate a fear of commitment? Well, first we might try framing commitment differently. So instead of talking about commitment as like a binding contract, we can discuss it as a partnership for mutual growth. So it's not about locking someone in, it's about the two of you rising together. So next you wanna take things step by step. Don't go from casual dating to discussing lifelong plans and three dates. You wanna introduce the idea of commitment gradually beginning with smaller things like planning a trip together several months down the line. Even if they try to initiate those conversations because they too can be swept up in the moment, you try to stay steady and take your time. That creates more space for them to move towards you instead of you wasting your energy trying to chase them down. Next, you wanna think about independence within unity, that interdependent state. So you wanna remind them that a committed relationship doesn't require sacrificing your individuality. It's entirely possible to be a we and still be a me. So for instance, instead of saying, where do you see us in five years? You might try asking, what's one adventure that you would love to experience together in the coming year? So this makes the idea of commitment less overwhelming and a bit more immediate. Number five, boundary violations. So boundaries are invisible lines that tend to keep us safe. But what happens when those lines get crossed? Now, while all of us have our comfort zones, avoidant partners are particularly sensitive when their boundaries are breached. And usually it's not about you. It's typically about them maintaining that sense of personal integrity and self-control. When that space is invaded, whether it's going through their personal items or trying to make a decision for them, it can send a signal to them that their personal agency is not being respected and that is a big deal breaker for them. Here's an example of triggered boundaries and how it can lead to a spiraling argument that quickly gets out of control. So imagine that you might pick up their phone because you just want to check the time and you notice that they physically tense up. Now it might seem trivial to you, but for them, it could be a significant breach of their personal space. And maybe now they assume that you're trying to invade their space and control them. So you in turn feel triggered, assuming that they must have something to hide if they flinch like that. And so that sparks an, sparks an argument over inaccurate assumptions on both sides. And now you're accusing each other of things and everyone feels angry, rejected, distrustful, and down about the relationship. So how do we mitigate the effect of crossed boundaries? Well, first, we wanna make sure that we are eliciting explicit permission. So before you cross into someone's personal boundaries, whether that is reading their messages or planning a surprise getaway, you wanna ask for permission. And be okay if the answer is no. Secondly, you wanna make sure that you engage in a dialogue before you assume anything. So don't assume that you know what's okay for someone else. Even in a committed relationship, it's really essential to check in and recalibrate those boundaries periodically. So for instance, instead of saying, I can tell you're angry, you'd feel better if you just talk about it. You might say, your jaw just clenched and your body looks tense. Penny for your thoughts? This respects their agency and extends an invitation to connect over their thoughts 
rather than their feelings and that's typically more appealing to them. Also, you're not assuming how they feel, you're very concretely communicating what you see and that you are sensing distress from what you see, but you're not labeling it with something or telling them how they feel. It's important to realize that an avoidant partner's need for well-defined boundaries isn't a rejection of you, but a form of self-preservation. They can also help you navigate the relationship more effectively and compassionately. It's not about walking on eggshells. It's about walking together, each respecting the other's pace and personal space. If you'd like to learn more about healthy boundaries, check out my video, Healthy versus Unhealthy Boundaries and How to Tell the Difference. Number six, demanding behavior. Ever wondered why asking for a little emotional support suddenly turns into a game of hide and seek? Why is it that a simple request might set off alarm bells for avoidant partners? Well, let's unpack this a little bit. Now, we all have needs and desires in a relationship, but the way that we communicate them can greatly impact an avoidant partner. Because to them, a demand, even if it's for emotional support, can feel like a potential loss of their own freedom and personal space. It's not that they're not interested in your well-being, they usually are, but the delivery makes all the difference. And the more intense your emotional energy is when you make a request, the more they're gonna feel overwhelmed and overstimulated by it. Hear me when I tell you this, language matters with avoidant partners and making requests. So the words you use to express your feelings can play a crucial role here. Evaluating language like, I feel abandoned by you, implies a judgment and creates an invisible demand for a very specific type of behavior. And that can cause them to withdraw. Instead, you might try expressing yourself with a genuine feeling word without a hidden should or must attached to it. So for example, instead of I feel abandoned, which evaluates their behavior, you might say, I feel lonely and lost. It would warm me to feel connected to you again. So this brings the focus back to your own emotional experience without demanding a specific action from them. This approach respects their autonomy and it invites them to meet your needs rather than commanding them to do so. Another example, maybe you notice your partner becoming distant after you text them. Why haven't you called? I feel like you're ignoring me. A more effective approach might be, I've missed hearing your voice. It always brightens my day. Now the key here is to navigate this delicate balance without losing sight of your own needs. Your needs are valid. It's just about presenting them in a way that respects your avoidant partner's sensitivities and allows them to step forward and move towards you willingly. Now, if you want to learn more about six effective communication tips with avoidant partners, check out the video on my YouTube channel. And lastly, number seven, criticism. So criticism can be a prickly subject, especially with avoidant partners. Now, criticism in and of itself, I believe, is a pretty terrible way to communicate with anyone, but especially with avoidant partners, because it ignites their deepest fears of inadequacy, of rejection, and of their loss of autonomy. Now, there is a difference between criticism and constructive feedback. But because avoidant partners are so sensitive to this, they can't really tell the difference. They may have a big reaction when you say that you don't like something and suddenly you'll feel like you detonated an emotional landmine. Why? Well, because they may perceive this as some kind of emotional manipulation and then misinterpret that as an attempt to control them. So to avoid sounding critical, we might try using soft strategies in communication. Now, soft strategies are not about muting your voice. They're about amplifying understanding. Soft strategies respect your partner's autonomy while conveying respect and appreciation. So this includes disarming honesty. So you're just gonna be transparent about your intentions. Make it very clear that your feedback is rooted in care and in respect, not in control. Secondly, you wanna use objective language. So you're gonna use descriptions of observable behaviors rather than attributing some kind of intent, meaning, or personality flaw to what you observe. You also wanna include what I'm gonna call temporal specificity. In other words, be specific about the time or the event that you are referring to. That's gonna narrow down the focus and it makes it less overwhelming and it makes it feel less like criticism. You also want to ask for feedback. You wanna open the door for them to share their perspective. It's not only gonna foster mutual respect, but it also underscores that you value their input. So instead of, you never listen to me and it makes me feel like you don't care, what's your problem? You might try this. You know, during our discussion about holiday plans, you seem preoccupied with your phone. I felt a little bit lost and frustrated and my mind started spinning assumptions about how much you care about me and our plans. Do you think we can talk about the best way to make our conversations more engaging for both of us? So those are our seven major triggers for avoidant partners and tips on how to mitigate them in relationships. Now let me know in the comments, have you witnessed triggers like these in your relationships? What methods have you found work well in establishing harmony? 
I'd love to read your feedback. So here are just a few final thoughts. Navigating the complex terrain of avoidant attachment can sometimes feel like trying to decipher an intricate dance. One misstep and you might find yourself stepping on each other's toes or feeling like you're out of sync. Yet understanding and harmonizing with an avoidant partner's sensitivities can transform your relationship into a beautifully choreographed waltz of intimacy and trust. Now, if you're ready to deepen that connection and turn potential pitfalls into those stepping stones for a stronger bond, then it's time to consider an invaluable resource. Now, I invite you to explore my comprehensive attachment courses, which are designed specifically for those entangled in the delicate nuances of the anxious avoidant trap and other styles of insecure attachment. Now, these courses, they are not just an investment in your relationship, it is an investment in your personal growth, and it lays the groundwork for a lasting love. So with my tailored strategies, compassionate insights, and actionable steps, you will learn how to create a shared rhythm that respects autonomy while fostering closeness in your relationship. So I invite you to click the link in the caption of this video and visit the page for my attachment online courses to determine the best fit for you. Don't let misunderstandings and miscommunication dictate the tempo of your relationship. You can take the lead in cultivating a secure and harmonious partnership that will withstand the ebb and flow of life's intricate dance. A loving relationship is out there for you and it is worth it. Thank you for joining me. Also remember to subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. I put out videos once a week and I wouldn't want you to miss out.